Ready or not, here we come, the holidays, yay! You're about to enter into a frantic season, often for people. My prayer is that you find blessing and purpose and deliberateness in what you do as we head into the Thanksgiving season this week. For those of you joining us online, we're honored to be able to share this experience with you. We, we align with those who are on the west side at our campus there. We want to gather today around the Word of God. We have been studying for quite some time this Roman letter, chapter 12, specifically calling it the University of Practical Faith. And it has been chocked full of very practical realities that are part of our experience as followers of Christ. And we're going to return there. Chapter 12, verse 14 to 21 is a concluding element, but we're going to break this down by some deliberate phrases over these next few weeks. Let me open these phrases in front of your attention today. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. That's actually not new territory for the Apostle Paul. He's actually quoting from the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 25. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are focusing our attention on those phrases under this idea. Don't give others what they deserve. I find here instruction on what not to do as I relate to others. When I finish reading those phrases, I have a question. What world is Paul living in? <laughs> Enemies who receive my kindness? Persecutors I am required to honor. Evil that I encounter should prompt in me a response of good. Revenge that would be fully predictable. Yet I am forbidden to take action. What world is Paul living in? I mean, certainly not mine. Have you been on the highways of Colorado Springs? And far beyond the trivial annoyance of traffic, there are horrendous people on this planet who do horrendous things. Evil things. And the nightly news keeps me abreast of the latest insanity with its itchy trigger finger. I ask you again, what world is Paul living in? Overcome evil with good. What kind of lame, anemic strategy is that? Hold that question. We'll attempt to answer it in a little bit, but... For the moment, I want to shape the context of this just a little bit. First, let me put it in the frame of where we've been in this particular series. A review of the practical faith lessons from Romans chapter 12. We began with an understanding that life of a follower is full surrender to Jesus Christ. Not partial, not a little bit, full surrender to the Lord Jesus. And that's aligning our thinking with God's truth. Quit filling your head with the nonsense the world wants to pour into you and allow the grace he has given you to keep you humble in your relationships as you have been a recipient of this gift. You give this grace. On to lesson four. We talked about what it is to follow. In the midst of a community, there is a synergy around the body of Christ, like a joint with its, with its knuckles, its sinew, its tendons, its muscles, all joining together for a single constructive purpose. That's the body of Christ. It's a people who need to be authentic in their love and discipline in their spirits, developing with intent and deliberateness what it is to follow in a heated passion the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We learned also that the joyful, patient prayer is the lifestyle of the believer. That's what it is. And last week, Pastor Brian opened to us open heart, open home, hospitality. That, that's just what these people do. And today, don't give people what they deserve. Now, that's, that's the first element of context for the teaching. I want to look at what's already been learned. But there's a second very important element where we would think about uh, what context is here. It's a warning. I want you to understand that Paul is not describing warring governments or international conflict here. I alert you to that because our tendency is to let our ideas about enemies leap immediately toward the brutality of war with all of its atrocities. And then we use that vision to deflect and to sidestep the really central issue which is his here. Today we're talking about enemies, but but not warring nations. Keep this discussion where Paul has it. We are in the midst of your daily life where you deal with hard people, stubborn people, obnoxious people, rude people, even enemies. While we are discussing today interaction with rude experiences that might arrive at your own kitchen table. They show up at your holiday reunions. Some of these people are coming to your house. Hmm. Enemies. This is totally practical Christian training among your life and mine. So, with with the context of where we've been and the, the warning about this text in place, let's enter the space. Don't give people what they deserve. Here's what I think they deserve. You treat me with rudeness, I return some of the same. If you hurt me, I'll hurt you worse. You insult me and you will encounter my ridicule. You gossip about me, I will spread extreme news about you. You threaten me, I will respond to terrorize you with fear. That's what you deserve. And the standard of my response is always based on how you treat me first. That's the standard. How you treat me, that sets the agenda of how I treat you. So, when Paul declares a higher ethic, and that's actually what he's doing here, he's proclaiming that the Christian forms their life, their behavioral ethic along lines that are very different from the rest of the world. Do not expect this sermon to be understood out there. It won't be. This is a message to believers about their behavior. Uh, Let me offer a picture to show the distinction. Human beings tend to function from two boxes. One is how I feel, and the other is the human will. I presented the bottle in even-sized squares. That's the concept But the picture doesn't really represent our true behavior. No, no. This picture better represents how humans usually behave. We tend to behave most from our feelings. We are reactive, sensitive, a bit combustible. We spend no time or effort ever attempting to premeditate our response to situations and thus having not thought about it in any way, we are constantly surprised, caught off guard, and so we react. We react out of our feelings. If something makes me feel bad, that box full of equal and usually larger reaction, all driven by my feelings, is going to come out. Feelings are very important to us. Likely the most important. As a matter of fact, how you feel has become very sacred space. Sacred human space. It is the idol to be worshipped. So many facets of our society are being organized in order to protect your right to live your life out of the box of feelings. See, this is how I feel today. And you are required to protect my right 
to feel like I feel. There are so many social interactions arising from the feeling box. Well, I guess that's what you just expect from a pagan world. I mean, the only ethic that would shape the life of a pagan is how I feel at the moment. Feeling rules. Feelings rule. Pacify me. Modify or medicate me. Change the rules for me. Alter the human landscape for me. Realign gender design for me. Modify my marriage for me. Uh, reform the impressions regarding living offspring in the womb for me. Because you see, I must be true to what I feel. Do you throw up when you hear that message from people? Feelings rule. That's just what you'd expect from a pagan world where man is the centerpiece and God has been disposed. Well, now, now we're back in Romans chapter 1. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became so futile and their foolish hearts were so dark. Although they claimed to be wise, sophisticated, smart, they became absolute fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings. See, people seem strangely satisfied, even drawn to cheap replicas, as long as those replicas represent themselves. On to verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to the depravity of their minds so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness and on he goes in the paragraph to describe just what wickedness looks like in the midst of the social context of life, family, and human reality. See, that reflects the social confusion when highest honor is given to human feelings. You can see the huge box. Feeling rules everything. Takes up every space. And if that's true, then, then I resurface the question again. Enemies who receive my kindness, persecutors I am required to honor, Evil that I encounter should trigger in me a response of good revenge that would be fully anticipated and predictable is forbidden for me to take action. What world does Paul live in? Allow me to tell you about Paul's world. We'll make use of a timeline. The year is 54 AD, approximately 20 or 3 or 4 years from, or whatever, to time from when Jesus completed his ministry. He left, ascended to heaven, leaving behind his apostles on the Mount of Olives, just outside the gates of Jerusalem. Those men were standing there in the compulsion and the command of Jesus, and when he said, go into all the world and make disciples, and those men did just that. They began to influence all of the Middle East into Asia Minor, on into Southern Europe, across Northern Africa. Christians by the thousands, Christianity spread dramatically. And by 54 AD, there would have been thousands of Christians, I believe, in Rome. But also in that year, a new emperor came to power. His name was Nero. He was 16 years old when he ascended, given the mantle of leadership. Sixteen! <laughs> Where he began to manifest all the self-absorption and the demand of lust for power, pleasure, prosperity that compelled by the energy of a testosterone-driven 16-year-old kid. In the midst of that arrogant drive, he made many enemies. You talk about political unrest, Social unrest? One of the odd groups that Nero encountered was this, across the city and across the empire, were these strange, quiet people. 
noble people who were given the name of the way. Character, integrity, Christianity turns out to be a chief enemy to a pagan. That's how it is with pagans. Moral substance, godliness, it's so offensive to a pagan. So threatening. It was to Nero. Two to maybe three years after Nero ascended the throne, this letter that we have been studying arrived in Rome. Best as I can tell, it was delivered by a woman named Phoebe, Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. She delivered that letter to the leaders of the church there, Priscilla and Aquila, who had a, a church meeting in their house every weekend. And there were other house churches in Rome as well. A large number of Christians meeting regularly. All right, so, so, let, so let, let me get this straight. Two years after a 16-year-old is given the tyrannical authority of the land, I, as a Christian, I'm sitting in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. I come to church on Sunday morning, and I listen to the instruction of Paul on how I am supposed, as a committed follower of Jesus Christ, how I am supposed to react and respond to enemies. And, and, and persecutors. Uh, I wonder how they handled this instruction regarding enemies and persecutors. I'll bet they had some questions. <laughs> About nine years after this letter, the situation socially and politically in Rome had swelled substantially. When Paul had given the guidance about the high ethic of Christian behavior, the scene has enlarged. And by 64 AD, Nero was 26 years old or so, there was a massive fire in the city of Rome. It burned nine days. Some say it was part of the social and political unrest. Some say it was started by Nero himself as an effort to squelch and punish the opposition. But from the soot and ash and smoky residue, approximately a third of the city was in cinders. Public sentiment was fierce and quick, and Nero deflected the responsibility by publicly and overtly blaming Christians for the crisis in the city. Christians are the arsonists, he pointed. And from there, persecution of these likely thousands of Christians in the city of a million or so more, it became extreme. People, because they were Christians, were rounded up, imprisoned, put on display in various measures of public torture. Nero used Christians as victims of sport. They, they were often wrapped in animal skins, tied tightly, then fed to packs of dolls so they could be tormented until their death. Others were dressed in shirts that were made out of stiff wax and poured in oil. They were fixed to axle, axle trees. Uh, that, that's the axle off of a wagon. You take two of those, you put it together, and then you, the, you bind the victim. And in their wax shirts and oily bodies, they are lit aflame. And those screams were the announcement of the opening ceremony of Nero's celebrated festivities. And I'm still going to church on Sunday morning at Priscilla and Aquila's house where they read to me the instruction about how I'm supposed to behave in the presence of my enemies. Oh, but it gets deeper. By the year 67 or 68, the Apostle Paul would have been beheaded in Rome after spending two years in prison waiting to see Nero. I'm not sure. We don't have any information. Have you ever got to have that encounter with Nero? I would have liked to have seen that one. Wow. But he's beheaded in Rome. The Apostle Peter also died in Rome under Nero's leadership. Nero himself, the crazed fanatic, he died by suicide in the summer, I think June of 68 AD. He was 29, maybe 30 years of age. So I pose the question again. What world was Paul living in? What? It was so much worse than yours. 
which makes his strategic training of the Christian ethic so much more striking. Listen to it. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. My dear friends, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, it is mine, that's God's, to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Or on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, you give them something to drink. In doing so, this will heap burning coals on his head. That, that's an ancient idea. I think it comes from the Egyptian world. It's really hard and obscure to figure out, but it has something to do with the sense of behavior so extraordinary that it would awaken the burning conscience of those who have lost conscience. Wow, that must some, be some behavior. Verse 21, do not, over, excuse me, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You do realize that Paul's preaching is really not his own here. He is simply parroting, mimicking, and expressing what Jesus had taught him and what he teaches us. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. But to you who are listening, I say, these are Jesus' words. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Such things sounded so extreme where you were living on the countryside of Judea or among the urban streets of Rome. You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, have been called to a higher ethic. It is an ethic based on divine wisdom, a wisdom centered on three universal and divine principles. Let me lay them out. Principle number one. Evil, met by evil, escalates evil. And the play out is almost always immediate. Which leads to a second universal principle. Evil, met by good, diffuses evil. Oh, but the play out could well be slow. Which leads to the third principle. God is the only one equipped to handle justice. So your play out must be that of release. I wonder what that means. Well, if those are the divine principles at work, then i got to figure out how to put such things in play. Now, I don't live in the presence of raw persecution. I've never gone to church on Sunday morning throughout my entire life wondering and anticipating if my life was going to be taken away because of my faith. That's, I've not encountered that. But if this Christian calling is in play in the extreme realities of life, then it is surely in play for me and my world. My adversary may not be donned in camel gear and face paint, and yet I have all kinds of people who contend against me. What is my behavior in that space? How do I bear the evidence that I am a follower of Jesus Christ? Is my reaction to the world from my box of feelings, or do I engage life from the human will? But the indwelling Holy Spirit is prompting and directing, even on the days when it doesn't feel right, it still might be the right thing to do. Let's get very practical. I have noticed in the process of human communication that there is a ladder of escalation. That's a ladder that shows up at your kitchen table. It shows up at staff meetings at work between parents and teens, between you and an aging parent that you are caring for, between you and a stranger who shows up at the same parking spot at the same moment. <laughs> Here's how it functions. A comment is said, and it may be laced with something derogatory, demeaning, accusing. It is expressed with all of its accompanying tone of voice. The respondent returns with an answer that is just one step up on the ladder of escalation. 
One step in increasing volume, one step intensifying, one step face getting redder, veins in the neck begins to bulge. And from that, the, the response of the initial participant ascends one more step, and you know where this is going. Communications. It's, it's the ladder of escalation. And now all that seemed like a pretty generic concept until you are the one standing on that ladder. And you know who lives at the top of that ladder. I remember a family reunion in Worthington, Minnesota one time. Uncles all around the table, each one of them farmers. A son-in-law who had come to the family was part of the county land management group. And I came in from the front yard to find my whole family clan on the top of the ladder. Everyone standing on the same rung. (laughs) Not a single person. All Christians seem to know how to diffuse. I wasn't involved in this because I didn't understand the issues at stake, but I am sure did notice how people can climb the ladder so fast. I mean, some people can climb the ladder. Some people can climb the ladder. So fast, some people. My wife Paula and I, we visit about this ladder of escalation. I guess it's because we've climbed it way too many times together. We try to confront it. I'm amazed at how old and how seasoned I have to really become in life before I start posing the question, what would diffuse this? Isn't that the right question? What would diffuse this? Let's get more specific. It is happening everywhere right now. In this room, in school hallways, in workplaces across this city, sports fields and convention centers, it is happening. Young and old are weighing in. Everyone is choosing a side. What's going on in Israel and Gaza is not happening only in the geography of Israel and Gaza. People choose a side. It seems like the noble thing to do, right? You may be half a world away, but we observe the manifestations of frontline battle tactics being deployed in our own space. It takes less than four seconds. For teenagers or retirees to ascend the ladder of escalation. And you know what happens at the top of the ladder. Principle one, evil, met by evil, escalates evil. And the play out will be immediate. Life is destroyed at the top of the ladder. Which leads to my question, what diffuses? You are the only people who are being called into the middle of that question. The people of God, Christians, are called into that question. Nobody else will get that. You are called to live on the side of the Lord God who has taught people principle number two. Evil met by good diffuses evil. Oh, the play out may be slower than you like. But you would have to repeat the behavior. Love's behavior. Repeat it again. Oh, but I tried the love thing and it didn't work on it, so I ain't doing that no more. No, no, no. It's love's behavior. Repeat. You are not the contributors to evil. You as a follower of Jesus Christ are the interrupters of evil. You are the ones intended to divert evil's obvious outcome. You are those called to a far higher ethic Do not attempt to fix what God has only able to design by his resolve. And that's the divine reality. Principle number three. God's the only one equipped to handle justice. You are not. (laughs) And so in the day you take on vengeance, you will only mess things up worse. When I see that intense face at the top of the ladder, this is what I think about. I've been up and down that ladder so many times. Finally, somewhere in my life, I started asking the question, what in the world could de-escalate this? And the answer comes in the divine truth principle. Good is the diffuser. 
Well, I didn't think that seemed that powerful. Apparently it is kindness, lower voice, less snotty tone, calm spirit. Better yet, let love intrude. Let honor show up and the value of the human being show up at the table. Here's the summary as we wrap up. First, Christians function from a higher ethic. Not from feeling, but from will. Think about this for a moment. Even on the Sunday where the head of the Apostle Paul is in an executor's basket, Paul still believes his words because he modeled that in every feature, even the prisoners and the guards who engaged him. You're still reading from Romans chapter 12. Christians function from a higher ethic. And secondly, it's a disciplined ethic that actually premeditates. I'll spend a little time with that concept here. It premeditates events and plans for godliness in conflict. What does it mean to premeditate this, this experience? Well, you know what? You've been through this a thousand times with that guy at work. You've been through this a hundred times at breakfast with your spouse. You pretty much know where these things are going to show up. And so why wouldn't I premeditate this prayerfully to think about how I respond, react, behave, what I express? That's what the disciplined ethic is. I actually begin to anticipate, premeditate for godliness. Here's what some of that means. Let's start with boundaries. You know, there were times in the life of the Apostle Paul where he actually exited settings where he was in danger. He didn't walk in just to get slapped and beat up for no reason. He went away. There were boundaries there. Jesus, in his ministry, there were times that he slipped through the crowd unnoticed because the hostility was raising so high. He didn't just walk in. Oh, there's times when a man may be called to lay it down. There's also times when you need to walk away. There's boundaries there. And if you are in a situation of abuse in your life, The spiritual ethic is not about sitting in that space and taking that again. Not at all. You you live in those boundaries. You protect yourself. Boundaries are important. Disciplined ethic. We also anticipate encounters. Think ahead. You know what? I've been in a situation before with that person at work. I know what they're going to say. It's going to be snotty. And then I move to a prayerful plan for diffusing. What would it take to diffuse that? I mean, if I give that back, I just know it's going to swell. What would it take to diffuse that? And finally, what does genuine love look like in the presence of this person? What would that look like? Lord, you've got to help me in this. Because right now, that person knows how to push everyone my buttons. Oofta. That's a Norwegian phrase. I don't know if you knew that phrase or not. Oofta. They know how to push my buttons? No. The buttons you have, you own. Nobody pushes your buttons. So what would it be to, to have genuine love? What would that look like? What is powerful enough to break the momentum of ascending evil? It is the intrusion of the character of God manifest in the people of God. That's us. Even on the days when it does not feel right, you have been called to a higher ethic. Do that. Do that. Pray with me as we close. Heavenly Father, you have called your people into a dynamic space where the environment is fluid in a constant way. Some days we feel like it moves from bad to worse and from worse to worse yet. But I'd ask, Father, that you would call us to be who you desire us to be, that your character could be shown in us. Give us wisdom and insight, understanding, empathy, 
for the burdens of life. Give us courage to tell your story. Through Jesus we pray.